Oh, Faith in Film, episode five, man. Um, this is probably the most controversial one we're going to do, I would think, right? Uh, so before... So far, anyways. So far, for sure. So Father and I both hadn't realized, like, <laughs> we'd both seen it years ago, and then we watched it, and it kind of, like, hit us, like, wow, man. But, uh, uh Hollywood's pretty gross and like it would I but I I had said I think this movie uh is like it didn't dawn on me the first time like that there was anything wrong at all whatsoever it isn't until like the Epstein allegations came out that I went wait a minute this might you know this might be a little bit of a strange movie but uh what did you think father well first of all happy Easter to everyone Christ happy Easter visited. yeah um well, let's get a little background. So the mission is a movie made about the Jesuits, probably with the help of the Jesuits in the 80s. And it's about 17th century missions in South America. And, you know, I went to a, a Jesuit high school and a Jesuit university. And we had to watch this every single year in my Jesuit high school. Um, but Patrick Coffin mentioned on YouTube or rather on Twitter a couple of days ago, uh, some of the um, um scenes with the kids wasn't so modest and yeah. and made the link to what you just said epstein and so it was a little late in the game i think you um you asked patrick and i mean we're gonna have like a little bit of a criticism of it um but i i didn't notice that either um and so we kind of kicked it back and forth should we stick with the show or not and um we decided to i think probably most of the people who had already seen it or who were going to watch tonight had already seen it um but yeah, I mean, now that we know who's in Hollywood, you know, when I was in high school in the 90s, we didn't know who was in Hollywood running the show and why they would want pictures of kids like that. So we'll probably, you know, we won't do that in the future. We'll be careful of the movies we pick. Uh, or maybe, yeah. people, maybe people who made the movie were innocent and they just thought, well, to be realistic, we have to have indigenous people dressed as indigenous people, which is nearly naked. Yeah. And, and you honestly don't really notice it while you watch it. Yeah. Not, I mean, not unless you're really looking for it. Well, that's the thing. I think if anybody that's not like doesn't have a like a I get a, a perversion, I mean, the movie's fine. It's just like somebody that probably I think does. Anthony just really wanted to do this one, so now we can say, well, uh, Apocalypto is not much worse. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I think this. I I think honestly, man, I just. I was shocked rewatching it, like at how much of it there was. I was like, eh. I mean, it's, I, I don't know. It's just, it's indigenous children and stuff like that. So like, I mean, if you're, if you have a normal brain, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. I, I think, but you know, you, the, the creepiness gets into, did the people making it have normal brains, you know? So, um, yeah, well, I think yeah, right. What a good way to start the show. I mean, this is going to sound like a cop out, but this is the first of our faith in film series. I didn't actually watch before, getting ready. I sent Rob the clips be because see, I know this movie so well from high school that um, I didn't even watch it. And so I was a little bit surprised when Patrick Coffin put that on Twitter, but then it's like, Oh yeah, he's right. Like, yeah. you know, and, and this is where we have to say is Hollywood our friend in any way, shape or form. And probably the answer is no. Um, so, but anyway, let's jump into the movie. Yeah. Well, also though, so Patrick made that comment and, I talked to Patrick. I was like, um, I was like, you think we should not do this? He goes, No, I think you absolutely should do it. He said, "Is there's, there's, there's amazing content in the movie? There's some actual little bit of controversy in it that I think will make for a good conversation." And that's what we're hoping to get to. So there's yeah. definitely some. Li uh, you have some uh, liberation theology mixed in at a few points in this movie, and those are the things that I think will be interesting to discuss, and especially the ending, because I had actually had a a preconceived notion that one was good and one was bad at the end. And you're like, no, 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 don't think so quick. And we, we had a little conversation. So when we get yeah, to that, that's, that'll be very That's what I'm looking forward to. Cause I'm going to ask you both who did the right thing at the end. And my answer in university was different than my answer now. And my answer in university was different than my answer in high school. Hmm. And I mean, I progressed in my understanding of obedience 
people probably aren't used to me promoting obedience, but we do have to see things through the eyes of obedience. And so that's going to be, I think that's going to be a really interesting discussion towards the end is which of the two priests, if either of them did the right thing and were either of them obedient to their vows or were, were they both obedient to their vows? And you're talking between Jeremy Irons and Robert Robert De Niro. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Mendoza and Father Gabriel. And I think also yeah. how when there is no separation of church and state, how the state corrupts the church. You sure. Know? I think that's a good right. Idea. Yeah. I mean, this is the, this is the Christ is King is a big topic this week. It is. And and I think I think the you know the state always had a lot to say about, you know, we don't want the church corrupting our blah blah blah. You know, the the, right. the, the, the intertwining of the secular and the religious in this movie, it's 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 pretty stark. And you do see the state corrupting the church and, and decisions that it shouldn't have made. Well, we'll get to it. We'll get to it when yeah. it comes. Um, hey, before I think I, before I'm, we jump in, I'd like to give um, a little bit, you know, when we watched this movie in high school, we thought it was historical fiction. Um, but it turns out it's not. It's, um, I mean, the artistic license is so broad in this movie, we really can't even consider it historical fiction. I mean, it is true that thousands and thousands of Jesuits went to South America, including in this area. But like one of the things that this movie... I think purposely gets wrong is the superior that told them to leave the mission was actually another Jesuit. It wasn't actually the Cardinal in real life. So let me read you, not that we all totally trust Wikipedia, but my argument here is that if even, if even Wikipedia gets this right, then uh, we can probably trust this. So let me read this uh, from Wikipedia. It says the mission, the movie that we're reviewing tonight is based on the events surrounding the Treaty of Madrid in 1750, in which Spain ceded part of the Jesuit Paraguay to Portugal. A significant subtext of the impending suppression of the Jesuits, of which Father Gabriel is warned by the film's narrator, Cardinal Altamirano, who is himself a Jesuit. So in other words, who we see in this movie, Cardinal Altamirano, in the real life story, which again is even stretched itself, is actually another Jesuit. And so Wikipedia says Altamirano speaking in hindsight in 1758, corresponds to the actual Andalusian Jesuit father, Luis Altamirano. So it's actually a Jesuit. The, the bad guy in this movie is not a cardinal, it's a Jesuit. And then it says this uh, Jesuit father, Luis Altamirano, was sent by Jesuit Superior General Ignacio Visconti to Paraguay in 1752 to transfer territory from Spain to Portugal. So Okay, so there's a lot of truth in this movie. There, In the 18th century in Paraguay, there was um, a lot of debate between church and state, slavery and conversion. So there's a lot of accuracy in the movie, but there's also so much artistic license that we can barely consider it historical fiction. But we can learn a ton from the missions from this movie. And just to go back to something you said a few minutes ago, Anthony, like, you know, we're not picking movies that are absolutely kosher, that are... I mean, imagine if we had a movie that perfectly represented the gospel. Yeah. Like The Chosen. That, <laughs> that, <laughs> that, <laughs> then Sorry. what would we have to, you know, there'd be no criticism. Uh, but, but there's no such thing as that. So we're picking movies that are the least bad to discuss. Well, no, we're also picking movies that are secular. This isn't a religious movie That's at right. all. We're picking yeah, secu right. secular movies that were like, hey, man, this it's, what's funny yeah. is the secular kind of got things better than than the cheesy Christian overly exertive, you know, like uh, Matt Walsh in reviewing Cabrini said that he, he reviewed Cabrini. He goes, look, there's a little overhanded with the girl boss stuff. He's like, but it wasn't cheesy like your average Christian movie that comes out nowadays because your typical yeah. Christian movie is very ham handed and cheesy and nobody wants to watch it. These movies were secular, had very much to do with the religious, had very much to do with showing it's before the um, it's before the scandals come out. So the church is not doesn't have that darkness cast over it during this time. The priests aren't shown as these manipulative people like it. I really do think this. This movie is uh, is a really interesting one to watch. I do think there's some liberation theology thrown in, and I think those things will be interesting to come up. So my first scene that I had picked... Well, can I, as long as we're given our caveats to start with, let me give along those lines. The reason I almost didn't want to watch this movie is 
the Jesuits justify infanticide yes. in this 18th century. No. Of course, 18th century Jesuits would never, ever, 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 never. ever justify. Yeah, we'll come infanticide. to that scene. That's okay, we're going to see that. Yeah, we're going to see right. that scene. So what I was going to say about my scenes, though, my the first scene I picked was the flute scene where he's playing the flute in the jungle, trying to attract them. But I don't I didn't pre-screen that after thinking about that. So we might want to skip that one. What was the first scene you have picked, Father? Uh, his uh, do, you remember, do you remember, Rob? Yeah, I have it here. Father's first scene is at 35 minutes. Okay. Your next scene, Anthony's at 31 at th minutes. 31. So let's do mine, the 31. Yeah. This is just so okay. So let's give let's give the explanation of what's going on here. So Mendoza, he is a he, slave that's trader. That's Robert De Niro's character. Robert De Niro's character is a slave trader. He's going into the, the jungles of South America, um, capture capturing the indigenous and selling them to the uh, Portuguese and the, and the Spanish. Um, he's in love with a woman. His younger brother also falls in love with this woman. The woman falls in love with the younger brother. So they start having an affair. When De Niro's character finds out about this affair, him and his brother have a duel. So it's not illegal. Mm -hmm. It's a duel. Like it just, they squared off. They both had swords. It was a duel since 18th century. And uh, De Niro's character kills his own brother. And that's really the setup to the whole movie. And seeing so De Niro goes from this slave trader with absolutely no moral compass whatsoever, has this duel with his brother and murders his brother and suddenly has this illumination of conscience. And he is just grief stricken at the thing that he did to his brother. So he's hiding in a jail cell and the chaplain of the prison gets... Uh, Father Gabriel, who's Jeremy Irons' character, and brings him to the prison to try and speak to De Niro's character because he's just, the guy's lost all hope. He's in despair, and he may take his own life. Okay. Um, yeah. Ready? Yeah. So, yeah, let's play that scene. This is the conversation between Jeremy Irons and Mendoza, which is uh, De Niro's character, after the brother was killed. And I'm going to... I'm going to do it in less than 30 second intervals. I don't want us okay. getting kicked again. So, ah. that's how you need to go on. Hold on. That seems quiet. It is a quiet scene. It is. Oh, man, this, the audio might not be great. Here, let's start over. And, you know, this was, this was what Jesuits, old school Jesuits, were great at. Is conversions of these big old tough guys. That's how you mean to go on. Place the subtitles. There is nothing else. That is life. There is no life. There is a way out. For me, there is no redemption. God gave us the burden of freedom. You chose your crime. You have the courage to choose your penance. Would you dare do that? There is no penance hard enough for me. So that's about 30 seconds, sir. Yeah, I didn't even pick up on this. There's a lot of this is pretty strong Cain and Abel vibes here, right? The, the brother kills the kills the other brother. I wasn't even thinking about that angle. Um no, yeah, that's so true. one of my favorite parts about this movie is the penance angle. So when you when you mm -hmm. see where this goes with the penance. It's really important because um, it's it, it, it and it'll go. I, I guess keep going with that, and you'll see where he finally gets to to where I wanted it to go. Do you dare try it? Do I dare? Do you dare to see it fail? So now his penance that he winds up choosing. I think, I think if we just talk over it, Rob, it's okay. Yeah, we can try. As long as we talk over it, I think it'll mess it up. So look at what he's doing. Like, this is a penance that you wouldn't even consider in modern times, right? In modern times, you go in and you get your three Hail Marys and two-hour father. This man is carrying his all of the, his equipment from when he was a his soldier. His armor, his sword, his, all of it. Yeah, it's probably like 150, 200 pounds of equipment around his back and hiking up these mountains for weeks. 
So let me give let me give a little sacramental in, injection here. Um, I think you can keep it rolling though, Rob, if you want. If as long as that's. I think if we're don't, talking over it, it, it you think so? Okay, I'm pretty sure. So a little sacramental injection here. I mean, if this movie were written by Catholics who really knew what, what happened in the 18th century in the sacraments, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. I'm not saying I actually know either way. But if this, if it was written by real Catholics, they would have understood that. Um, Father, that's a great <laughs> dragging mail in ballots. By, by. Um, Rob, also, this scene we don't need the audio. Maybe if you turn the audio off, that'll actually help us too, right? Like, oh, yeah. So, see, he would have gotten a penance from Father Gabriel, right? He would have gotten maybe, maybe Father Gabriel would have said, I don't know, carry your old night equipment up uh, 116th of, of the falls. Um, but then he decides to go beyond it. And this is a good point for anyone out there. Sometimes people have like, they want to argue with their priests on the penance or ask for something else. Just accept what you get. And if you want to add to it, you can. There's a lot yeah. of traditionalists. They go to a Novus Ordo priest. They get too light of a penance. And then, then they ended up in a snarky discussion asking for something more. No, just be obedient. Do your penance and do something more later. Well, this ties into this scene because presuming that he received a penance, remember the brother who is, um, uh, who's the Irishman there? Liam Neeson. Yeah, Liam Neeson. We're going to hear him say later, he's done enough. And Father Gabriel agrees with him, but he says, but he doesn't think so. Right. Right. Yeah, this is a very unique penance in that, first of all, most of us aren't going and commit, committing, uh, confessing to taking our own brother's life. I mean, come on, this trading is a, also. Yeah, it's like, this is this is a very unique situation. And, and also, the priest himself has a very unique relationship with the penitent. Mm -hmm. where this isn't just some like most of us don't have a regular confessor most of the time some people do but you know this is this is a very unique situation is all i'm yeah. saying and see it's not just the penance for killing his brother because see he's carrying all of his slave trading equipment right there mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's a yeah, penance so, for his entire former life yeah so he he doesn't just feel guilt for what he did to his brother yeah it's like what he did to his brother he saw as his conscience being whittled down from the life he was living so bad that he got to a point where he could take his brother's life. And if there's any non-Catholics watching again, we're presuming he received absolution, which is the blood of Christ cleansing him. So we don't believe this can make, I mean, nothing can make up for slave trading and killing your brother. Only the blood of Jesus can. And that's what we believe is transferred to his soul in absolution. But the temporary effects of sin can be healed through taking on penance in your life. And this is what he's doing here. It's not that he can make up for that. Nobody can make up for a dead brother. No one's going to get that brother back, right? But yeah. he's trying to do some penance for the temporal punishments of sin here. Yeah, it's it's pretty. Uh, it's I, I just love how <laughs> this whole scene goes. Uh, almost dual Rob of a go sleeping. So it mm. was just it was just a really interesting thing to. I mean, this penance scene was such a. A huge part of this and you see him just trying to go up the mountain and it keeps pulling him down and keeps going up and keeps pulling him down so what what's the next scene father has rob he has 35 it's pretty minutes. close it's it's really just um the scene when they get to the top and we don't know if the natives are going to accept his penance or not okay um, yeah and that's 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 a pretty well, is that the one i picked next no the it's the one with the he's done this penance long enough but there's um a part of that that is actually really good that we should get to where okay we talk about um not being a democracy and mm -hmm. i think we're literally right. coming up that on ties into right later now. Things. wait real quick rob what what, what were your initial thoughts because you watched it right yeah yeah i watched it Are you, i i did because that's your first time watching it what, what were you like just overall quick snap like what did you think of it i almost consider the entire movie a sequel to apocalypto it, it does kind seem like one, right? Because wow. Ap Apocalypto, you see their light, you know, these you know, Apocalypto's not 100% historic either, because you don't know are, are they Mayan, are they Aztec? They're kind of a mix of both. But it's the life of the people in the jungle before Christianity arrives. Mm -hmm. Here we, we kind of see that with the, the Guarani um, prior to the Jesuits, but then the Jesuits you know, you see them start to wear clothes more they build the church. They learn Latin. They're singing the hymns, and then you see kind of secularism, um, almost secular paganism, come back 
and they go back into the jungle and you see these these children of of all these dead warriors kind yeah. of take the remnants of christian civilization back into the jungle so it's kind of a sequel to apocalypto but also very um apropos for like our time right now like we're taking the remnants of christian civilization and we might have to go hide with them somewhere in the jungle mm. yeah, it's a, that's pretty perceptive and it's also like it's it's strange because you're seeing the sequel to apocalypto where you're seeing the beginning of this this is a little further along than just the beginning but you have second christendom being built the, the the you'll see later on in the in the main mission that's there the people are wearing clothes they have been mm -hmm. civilized and they are becoming just christian but the ones that are still very indigenous around in the jungle and those are the ones that he's actually trying to bring, bring this new mission to and he's trying to help civilize them and it starts off where they get the mission started and he starts teaching them to sing and things like this and part of the argument that's coming from the, the Portuguese and the Spanish against the, the church is these people aren't human, right? They're, they're, these people are basically animals, you know? So, all right, so let's get to, let's get to that part Rob, Rob was talking about. He's done this penance long enough. And, well, the other brothers think the same. But he doesn't think so, John. He does, that, so do I. Not the members of a democracy, Father. Members of an order. Yeah, that's 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 really an interesting point, right? Yeah, Especially and that's see that's going to tie into the last scene that I look forward to discussing with you guys, because you know how are Catholics different from Protestants? Well, we believe in order, and then how yeah. does that tie into our current church crisis when everyone who promotes obedience in church history is seen as the people who are disobedient, right? Yeah. So it's a really interesting topic for what we're going through in the church right now. Um. So my next scene is the Mendoza conversion, and that's, that's at 39 that's minutes. Father's next scene, too. Okay, perfect. So we got that. But we both picked that scene. Okay, let me pull that one up real quick. It's pretty much the... <laughs> Oh, Rob, that was the uh, that was the Korean news war nuke uh, clip that I sent you earlier. I, are you sure that wasn't part of the movie? Yeah, that's all right. right. Okay, let me look for it. What did I just sit through? <laughs> what did I just sit through? <laughs> did you not tell Anthony? I thought I did. <laughs> I thought you told Anthony. <laughs> I've actually I get... popped that in every episode just randomly. <laughs> yeah, that's basically the Rick roll of the episode. Like, wait, what did I just watch? <laughs> You're gonna get to see that every uh every episode at random times. Uh, see the goal. Okay, whoever whoever can't keep a deadpan face has to buy the other guy's whiskey or something. So that's yeah, I guess Rob, that only Rob's gonna know where he drops it. <laughs> That's well, a real keep, we'll keep a tally for the next time we all get. Yeah, I watched it. I watched a um, documentary on Kim Jong Un, and that's a real news clip from Korea after they did a nuclear test. That's his sister. No, uh, no that's the, the whole documentary is about his sister, but that's just a, a Korean news anchor. All right, we got kimchi rolled. Kimchi rolled. <laughs> <laughs> Can we just watch that one more time, just yes. since we're talking about it? Just one okay, more time. Okay, so now that you know it's coming here, here we go. 된다. 대륙간 캔더 로켓 장착용 소소한 시험에서 완전 성공. It's a total success. <laughs> I want Anthony to give us his impression of that. No, we better not. I mean, okay, we're gonna, right. <laughs> we're gonna like clip it and then attack me instead of Anthony. Very sorry, very sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> He's friends with racists. It's very, 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 uh, very, no. very, 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 no, no, just all right. Go to the all right. Uh, all right, okay. let's go. All right, so this is the conversion scene. So, this is so look, he's been this is a good 15 minutes of the movie is spent with him just drudging this equipment through the through the jungle, and he's he's a beaten man at this point. So, yeah, okay, pull it together. Come on, let's go. 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 Come on,
Hey, Rob, maybe pause it just so we don't get kicked off YouTube real quick. Now, what I thought was interesting right there is Father Gabriel stopped Brother John there, almost like Father Gabriel knew the behavior and the patterns of the natives more than Brother John, or perhaps he understood this was the end of his penance, was just death and he deserved it. I think it was probably the former, not the latter, but wasn't that interesting how Father, um, or maybe the third option is Father Gabriel simply knew with with brother John and him there, they were simply outnumbered by the indigenous people. There's no, there's nothing anyone could do anyway. So, Hey, just hang back and we're going to see what happens. Yeah. I thought it was interesting that the natives have a very nice, uh, steel knife. But anyways. <laughs> well, they could have gotten that from the, well, could have been traded, right? If, no, but well. they, no, but I mean, there's a lot of pre-Christian cultures that had good, um, iron knives and stuff. Pre-colonial, pre-colonial indigenous people often had ironware. Uh, did we want more of this scene? No. Nope. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep going. I okay. just wanted to. I only pause this so we don't get kicked off yep. YouTube. Nope. We were just kicked. No. Uh, seriously. Yep. yep. Temporary blocked. Ah. Uh, what are we gonna Even do with about pausing this? it? Wow. Do you think it was this scene or a previous one? This stinks. All of it. Oh, really? Yeah, that, I don't. I don't know how they do it. We're gonna have to figure out something else for if we keep. Might going have to on do it on locals. Should we just do it on locals? Mm. Well, I, we uh, can't move the stream over now. No, I know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this off the screen, and we'll just wait for it to come back. Um, I mean, we're still in we're still on Facebook and Twitter, so we are still live. But let's just wait here. So maybe we just do it on Twitter. It might have to be. We could we could we do have a lot of, on Twitter. We have a lot of listeners on Twitter, do we? Most we have more on Twitter right now than we do on YouTube. Oh, we do really? Okay. And then we, we can, can always submit it. We can always upload YouTube. it to YouTube after. So we do it live on Twitter, and then we can mm. always upload it to Twitter uh, to YouTube after. Is that is that easy enough? Yeah, really. Let's yeah. wait till we come back on so we can at least tell everybody yeah, to do that. No, we're live now. We okay. would do this on locals, Brian, but this does oftentimes go longer than two hours. And locals doesn't allow that right now, anyway. So, so, so we're we thinking, can't really do it. Locals. We're thinking we might do it on Twitter, the live show. So if everybody goes to Twitter, you could you could watch the live show for free, and then we'll later on we'll upload it after we get we'll submit it for copyright stuff, and then once it's approved from YouTube, then put it because this the dropping the constant dropping really is pretty annoying. Yeah. So now that guys, it happened once, we try. I mean, we might get twenty seconds into the next clip, and it would probably do it again. And it'll do it again. So if you guys follow us on Twitter, hop over to Twitter and watch us over there. You guys, this way, you guys can at least comment and and stuff. And then we really don't. We could just play whatever from Twitter, and we don't have to worry about getting kicked off at all. We could play scenes as long as we want. That might be the best way to go about this. And then we'll just put we'll put we'll run it through the YouTube. Because um, at least at least on Twitter we can still put comments up on screen. We can't do that on locals either. It's another right. reason we're not doing it on locals. Yeah, so t I think Twitter's the way to go. Okay, so people are starting to switch over. Once you guys switch over, just start clicking. You did, and then we'll kill the YouTube stream. Yeah, well, we'll just I'll 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 delete the original file on YouTube and then upload this new one. Um. Uh, all right. So he says I don't use Twitter. I'll sit this one out. Uh, you will get the the. You'll get it. You just won't get it live. Yeah. Like you'll get it in a day yeah. or two after Rob submits it, and we get clearance on it. So, but yeah, everybody that can just jump over to uh, um, Twitter. It is right now live on the Avoiding Babylon on Anthony's and on mine, so it doesn't really matter. And I just retweeted it also. Yeah. So from my account, from Rob's account, or the actual main Avoiding Babylon account. Um, okay. All right, Rob. Let's let's over. let's kill YouTube, and this way here we could just do whatever we want. We don't have to worry. Okay, killing YouTube now. Okay, YouTube is... Okay, I want to delete it on YouTube too. And we'll still be live on Facebook as well. Ah, uh, okay. 
Okay. So we are live on Twitter and Facebook. And we should be safe from... What's the Facebook of- page? Is that Avoiding Babylon? Yep. Okay. I'll, I'll put that online too. All right, sorry, well, sorry for the dead air, guys. We, we, we win all these appeals because yeah, that's that's what's annoying because it's fair this, use. Is, this is good for all the copyright holders. What we're doing is good for them, promoting their movies. Like we chose yeah. their movies because they're good, but this is it's just a little too annoying. So now you guys can still comment. Like we could still see your comments. We could uh, pop them up, and um, it would be it would be nice if we're on the same account and have the same chat stream. That's a good point. So we'll just tell people it's going to come out. Like if we do this the last Thursday of the month, we'll just say last Friday of the month is when it comes out on YouTube, huh? Should be it. As long as it depends on the appeal process. Because I'm as I as we upload it, we'll get dinged for the copyright. We'll have to appeal. But it should be up on Fridays, yeah. All right, let's keep rolling. Okay, so now we can just do what we got to do. We don't have to talk over it. We can actually just play the clip, so... As long as we need. Yeah. I wish they had subtitles for what the what the Indians were saying. Yeah, I don't know why they didn't do that. Because it I kind of would like to know their reasoning for what they just did. And that's the mystery of it. I suppose. <laughs> I thought it was beautiful how he almost couldn't do enough and in, in his own mind. Yeah. But when they came around and freed him of it, it was that was what gave him the permission to forgive himself. Like he it was yeah. almost like it wasn't within his power to forgive himself for these things. It wasn't until the people he was actually trying to enslave gave him that pass that he he finally felt like okay i i've been forgiven yeah that's right brad thinks it's actually a good thing that they don't have those subtitles i guess so right there's certain certain times where you could kind of just you you know what's what's being said let's see what's um, next it's like the uh the it's like the dinner scene when uh, michael corleone uh kills salazzo and this are we are we ever going to get time. through a single movie review with another? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so my next one is the, the the first time De Niro reads the gospel. Uh, what was Father's? Uh, his, his next one is like an hour after that. So okay, so we'll play a few of my clips. I thought the first time uh, De Niro reading the gospel was good. And real there quick, before, is, before we get to that, isn't it amazing that pagans forgive him before, probably if he was back in Portugal, what, how the Portuguese who were baptized would forgive him? Baptized and raised in a culture being told how 
he who does not forgive the sins of his brother will not be forgiven. The, 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 the measure which you give is the measure you'll receive. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, I think, I think, is his name Menendez or Mendez? What's his name? Mendoza. 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 I think Mendoza. I mean, I, they, they portray him very well. There is pretty much accepting his fate. They're about to slit his throat, you know? Yeah. That's that, that anticipation is so brilliant there. He thinks his throat's going to get slit and, uh, and they cut off the ropes, his penances and forgive him. And really you could make the argument that changes the entire trajectory of the mission because here, you know, the way that liberals always describe this is white man comes in with arrogance and, and happens to have the gospel and all kinds of blankets full of smallpox and stuff, but it's primarily his arrogance and stuff. So, you know, I don't think there's usually truth to the leftist history, but let's say there's just like a tiny, 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 tiny little grain of truth that there is arrogance in white man coming to bring Christianity. Well, you see the great humility in that scene that that humility might have paved the way for the entire success of that mission until uh, the secular powers and the cardinal, at least in the movie, end up shutting down the mission. It, it, at least what I'm trying to say is um, that scene seems to, to change the entire trajectory of the natives trusting the Jesuit. Cause you can't just say, well, you just have to trust Jesus. Well, but they're his ambassadors. If I can't trust his ambassadors, I can't trust this person you're telling me about is my savior. Yeah. And in seeing that the ambassadors are humble, then they can maybe believe that the King, the crucified King that they represent is humble. So that scene is very key to changing the entire trajectory of how the indigenous people trust the Europeans. And that theme comes up later on that you're yeah, discussing. That's that right. The theme of trusting the king by trusting his ambassadors comes up later on. Mm -hmm. Somebody's saying this is a De Niro film. So De Niro acted in it. But what I found out was the same guy who wrote the script for this wrote the script for A Man for All Seasons. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. The same, the same script writer wrote The Man for All Seasons, which is interesting, right? Because that's the first movie we did. And now it comes comes kind of full circle on this one. Interesting. I didn't know that. So, yeah, so let's go to uh, De Niro reading the gospel. There is definite nudity in this clip. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Oh, should we skip it then? Yeah. I thought it was just them up in the... Let me just... I'll, I'll Hold on. Let me review it on my... Yeah, you screen it beforehand. Oh, I see. They're scanning over the... Yeah, well, because he he's doing activities. You see him do activities with the village. Yeah, there's too much. I mean, the fact a priest is on this um, yeah. podcast, it's just... Yeah, we'll, we'll, going we'll on cut that out. World. Okay, it's about, yeah, it's, I, I don't want to bring it up. How about, how about my next one, Rob? Rob, yeah, uh, Father Gabriel before the Cardinal. That should be just fine. So, Linda, we, we got off YouTube because they kept cutting the stream on us because of copyright. So we're going to upload this to YouTube later on. We figured on here we could do whatever we have to do, and then we could always just upload it to YouTube later on. We actually have 530 people watching it's, uh, the live we, stream on Twitter right now. On so. Twitter? Are you serious? Yeah. Wow. yeah we've, we've, we've gained about 200 people since we went just oh, to wow. Twitter, Twitter. So, all right. Okay, yeah, well, let's go. Hopefully the Cardinal keeps his clothes on. I'm glad Phil's on Twitter because Phil really does love this series. So now they can't super chat. Continue, Father. <laughs> Your Eminence, below the falls, the jungle, if it has to be divided, may be divided between the Spanish and the Portuguese, as you have agreed. But in reality, above the falls, it still belongs to God and the Guarani. There's no one else there. And they are not naturally animal. They're naturally spiritual. Spiritual? They kill their own young. That is true. May I answer that? Every man and woman is allowed one child. If a third is born, it is immediately killed. But this is not some animal right. It's a necessity for survival. Okay, can you pause that? You can only run with one child apiece. So a true Jesuit, a true saintly Jesuit would have never said it's necessary for survival. He would have said, it's true. And by the power of the gospel, we're going to extricate that out of them. Or That's we're going to it. Convert them. Right. 
Yeah. Um, first of all, I don't even think tons of pagan tribes killed excessive children. I mean, it happened, but I don't think it was like as common as what we have in it, the West with A B O R T I O N. Or right? the Chinese one, uh, yeah. one child policy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So first of all, I don't even know if it's historically true, but even if it were, the Jesuit should have said, yes, it's true. But by the Cardinal allowing us to convert them, that's exactly what we're going to see change. If you put the gospel ahead of your slave trade and your money, that would have been the right answer. And it would have been the historically accurate answer. No Jesuit before the 1960s would, would have ever said it's true, but uh, climate problems, they have to do it, you know? Yeah. The, the thing is, he does make a good point though. This isn't like, it's not a ritual. It's not like they're doing it to, to gain good favor from their other gods. No, he, he's they're saying doing it's it. rational. It might be wrong. Yeah. But- it's, it's from a place of rationality, and if we are able to come in here, we will stop this practice. And that, and that yeah. is the that is what we did throughout all of spreading the gospel, because there was human sacrifice all over the world, and all of it was meant to get rid of these uh, these horrific practices of the pagans. But, but yeah, some, like some of the um, indigenous tribes were doing it to satiate the hunger of yeah, their, yeah. their demons, which yeah. they called gods, right? I mean, if you look at Cortez showing up in what's now called Mexico City, the Aztecs were slaughtering those people on the pyramids um, up to tens of thousands a day, eighty thousand hearts, being, a single hearts day. being ripped out because they believed that the sun god would not be satiated if this many people weren't killed and the earth was going to go cold. Now, connect that to abortion. Isn't that amazing that we now believe if there's too many people, the earth's going to go hot? Not that we believe it, not, not that the three of us. But the more things change, the more they stay the same. That yeah. demons have tricked people into climate change, and that climate change is why we have to kill people. Yeah, that's the Rob's point. Practical, pa- rational paganism, not like our modern culture with birth control. Right. <laughs> right. It's, I mean, like, people it's very... use birth control for, for material reasons, just like. The Guarani were were killing children. It was for material, practical, you know, what they thought were practical reasons. So there's 600 people watching right now. If you guys follow me on Twitter and I don't follow you back, the people that are watching right now, just let me know you watch this series and I'll make sure I follow you guys back. Because I try to I try to follow back people that watch the show. Um, and if, yeah, you, if is, you follow me, you'll have a bunch of angry uh, uh, Daily Wire, Daily Wire uh, wine moms after you. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is another point. The series is great, even though I haven't watched any of the films. I love hearing you guys break down everything. Yeah, if you do not watch the movie before we do the show, still watch the show because yeah, it's, we're not blowing the movie, but it might inspire you to go and watch it. And the conversations we're having from it are what really the reason we're doing it. So, yeah, that's about my only line that I think was projecting modern school Jesuitism onto the old school Jesuits. Yeah. And even most of the liberal Jesuits nowadays aren't fully pro abortion, right? But to even justify it at all, you never would hear a 17th century or 18th century Jesuit justify that at all, whether it was for practical reasons or, you know, satiating the gods. Anyway, we've talked enough about it. Keep yeah. going on. The, I say, I say, we stay with the scene though, because the scene. Yeah, let's stay with the plays scene. Out. This, this is an important scene. Yep. And just for anyone who doesn't know, this was, um, the Jesuits were basically at this point of time, they're, they were, they're about to be suppressed. You know, it's not because of the reason they should be suppressed now. Exactly. It's, be, it's because of power, European power politics between Spain, Portugal, and France. The movie doesn't mention France, but it, it was between those three nations, both in Europe, as well as in their American colonies, the Jesuits held a lot of power and each of these three nations wanted that power. And in about 20 years after this film is supposed to have taken place, they succeeded and had, they were able to have the Pope suppress the Jesuits. Yeah, that's one of my favorite parts of this movie is you see the beginning of the end of the Jesuits. Like this is really where the part, you know, because it's it's really what's happening in Europe that gets the Jesuits suppressed, but it's not just Europe. I never realized what's going on in South America is affecting Europe because it's the new world and they're dealing with trade issues. And the Jesuits are just a, like a, 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 a problem for them everywhere because the yeah. Jesuits are faithful. And, they, and, and it's jealousy. They're, they're jealous that they have this much influence, this much influence on the gospel, this much 
um, power, even though they, I believe they were living poverty quite well. It was simply jealousy among the secular clergy and maybe, maybe even the other religious that they were so successful. And this is right because, uh, 15 years after the Jesuits are suppressed, the French revolution happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these secular forces were already long at work in these nations. So the whole, the whole anti-secular movement really is kicked off with suppression of the Jesuits. So, yeah. And this is a point I'm going to bring up for the last scene, the last war scene on when I ask you guys who did the right thing. But as long as we're talking about this now, let's let's be clear. All the Jesuits obeyed that suppression, even though it was an un. and this is one of the things I want to talk about towards the end of this podcast is what is the difference between an unjust order and an unfair order? The suppression of the Jesuits was unfair, but they still followed it because they had taken their fourth vow of obedience to the pope. Yeah. Um, now that Pope, right after he died, his whole body got corrupted and rotted within like an hour. That seems to be God's judgment on that. That Pope probably went to hell, but the Jesuits still obeyed and they should have obeyed because they have a fourth vow of obedience to the Pope. Uh, yeah. But the Pope was Catholic. <laughs> the Pope was Catholic. <laughs> and that's actually, <laughs> we're going to talk about that later. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's, let's continue with the scene. what do they run from? They run from us. That is, they run from slavery. Slavery rubbish. It is well known. Rubbish. 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 Your eminence. Your eminence. Rubbish. Rubbish. Your eminence. Your eminence. Your eminence. In the territories covered by Spain, there is no slavery. That institution, however, is permitted in the territories of our excellent neighbors, the Portuguese and is to my mind much misunderstood. But here, here in Spanish territory, we conduct our plantation in strict accordance with the laws of Spain and the precepts of the church. Pause it real quick. You look at the whole debate going on about Catholics and politics and Christ the King. You look at Lila Rose the other day saying that she doesn't think Catholics should be. Look at how involved the church is in matters of the state. You have these two statesmen arguing before the church. And the church is the arbiter between them. So what you what, what you see is actually the state meddling in church affairs. So the, there is this very tight unity of church and state still happening. This is... Before the American Revolution, right? This is 1773. About 20 years. This was 1750 or so. Okay, so this is before the American Revolution. This is what I mean. You you did have the um the Protestant Revolution in Europe already, but still the, the unity of church and state, especially with Catholic Spain, is still very strong. Portugal's supposed to be well, a Catholic that, country. At this point, not so much, actually. This was about really it, the degradation between church and state in Spain started about a hundred years before this. Okay. But hold on. So, but wouldn't, wouldn't a Catholic today who is not in favor of the social reign of Christ, the King, look at this movie and say, here's why Christ should only be King of hearts, men's hearts, women's hearts, children's hearts. There shouldn't be a social reign of Christ, the King, because we see in this movie how they mess it up. How, how yeah. the, how the intermingling of church and state messes up the missions i don't i don't agree with that but if i were on the side of those yeah, the yeah, yeah you wait in the past out, yeah. couple weeks uh, who who say no christ is only king of our hearts we don't believe in an earthly kingdom a social reign of christ the king i would look at this movie and i would say this is a perfect example where the missions need to be separated and not entwined with corrupt governments you, i think you I, could say that but i think that scene right there when they're talking about all well at least the Spanish don't allow slavery. There's a reason the Spanish did it. And that's because at least prior to this, they were heavily influenced by the church. And that's why the Spanish were the first to outlaw slavery. So it's a great, all, the, all the that's good things answer, that this Rob. movie shows yep. only exist because of the church's influence within Christendom at the time. That's right. And you look at the Dominican Bartolome de las Casas, um, his work as a Dominican in the New World was instrumental in making sure that all the greedy slave traders um, at least got dialed down a bit. And mm -hmm. if they had separation of church and state, 
the work of Bartolomé de las Casas would have been pretty ineffectual, I believe, um, because, you know, the secular governments uh, at least had to, um, if not obey the church, at least give a major nod to the church because they always understood that the social reign of Christ the King was a real thing. Yeah. Because yeah. so l- slavery the- existed a lot longer under under secular Britain and America than it did under, under right. Catholic Spain. That's right. Um, one of the funniest parts of this scene, which I, did, I didn't even pick up on until everybody is pointing it out to me, but that guy that's arguing before the Cardinal is Maury from the Goodfellas, which Maury, uh, he, he's a wig salesman who borrowed money from De Niro, and De Niro in, the, in Goodfellas is bashing him over the head with a phone, and his wig falls off. That guy there? <laughs> Yeah, that guy right there. <laughs> so I know you guys don't have the same Catholic, uh, Italian culture. That, I do. Italian that movie culture. was like that movie was so such an, a, an ingrained part of my youth growing and, up. And for so. those of you who haven't watched this movie, that that guy right there, who's claiming that there is no slavery, is the guy that Mendoza, Robert De Niro's character, was selling slaves to. To. Correct. Well, and wait, quick, you see, you know, what we're about to see, you cut it off right before De Niro calls him a liar. You know, nowadays, Catholics battle Catholics on Twitter. They call each other liars. Nobody nobody really cares. But back when the truth actually mattered to people, even the bad guys cared about the truth. When De Niro says it's a lie, this slave trade, the Spanish guy, immediately stops in his tracks. And I think we as moderns miss, like, to be called a liar publicly, that's like... You know your, rep- your uh, reputation, you, your yeah. One of, if one of you guys being accused of like adultery or me breaking my vows as mm-hmm. a priest, you know, who you're only as good as your word to be called a liar publicly, we don't realize that's your entire being being called into question. I wish we were back in days like that because De Niro's correct, he is a liar. But then, then they have to navigate all of this stuff of like, well, what does this mean if he doesn't apologize and stuff? But, yeah, let's go through it. Let's watch. Yeah, let's it. go through let's it. Show it. Everybody. <laughs> Covered by Spain, there is no slavery. That institution, however, is permitted in the territories of our excellent neighbors, the Portuguese, and is, to my mind, much misunderstood. But here, here in Spanish territory, we conduct our plantation in strict accordance with the laws of Spain and the precepts of the church. I just love how they couldn't be bothered to find a single Spanish or Portuguese actor for these characters. <laughs> That is a lie. That is a lie. I cannot and will not accept a challenge from a monk. His cloth protects him. My cloth name, protects you, In the Senor name Cabeza. of the king, whose dignity I represent, I demand an apology. I want an apology now. Damn you, I won't stand for that. Oh, there's the wig. <laughs> <laughs> So the next scene I had, real quick, I I always wanted when I was in the Roman collar, even this hermit habit, I always wanted someone to be like, "That Roman collar protects you," and I'd be like, "It protects you." <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe they made you watch this every year in high school. That's pretty funny. Yeah. Um. So the the next scene I have is one minute and one second because yep. this is the the it's probably like right there, right? It is. Yeah. Don Cabeza connives at this? Yes. He profits by it too. Don Cabeza wants the mission territories to be taken over by the Portuguese. Why? Because the missions are the only sanctuary left for the Guarani. Without the shelter we provide under the laws of Spain, the Indians have no protection against slavery. At the moment, they come to us of their own free will. Truly? Ask them, ask the Guarani. Nine tenths of what they earn goes back into the community, into their lives. Father Gabriel, what do you think is at issue here? I think the work of God is at issue here. No, what is at issue here is the very existence of the Jesuit order, both here and in Europe. And I assure you, Father Gabriel, that the courts of Europe are a jungle in comparison with which your jungle here is a well-kept garden. But your eminence is not to stand in our way. Thank you. 
So we uh, a lot of the things that we're get, we're working our way up to are does De Niro or Jeremy Irons, which one of them did the right thing? But I mean, did the Cardinal do the right thing? He, he, because the Cardinals got this burden on him, he has to make a decision what to do with these missions. And as you see where what comes of them, uh, it's it's pretty interesting. It, and it uh, the movie doesn't really mention it, but like peace in Europe is kind of at stake here too. Like uh, I, I forget what treaty it was between the Spanish and Portuguese decided on this transfer of land so if the church in a sense scuttles that treaty it could mean war in continental europe even so there's a lot at stake besides just the missions potentially yeah but it is for the struggle of the jesuit order itself mm -hmm. which is which yeah. is strange because you, you see father gabriel thinks he's just there to save souls like his he's like what are you what are you talking about i'm just here to save souls he's trying to and and we all right so we're going to Real head quick, into, i want to jump in on that though yeah. you know there's a heresy of moral theology called consequentialism, which is when you look at the permutations of what's going to happen based on like, in other words, consequentialism. And this is a moral heresy is when you, you look at outcome instead of doing the right thing here and now in the very immediate environment. So we saw that in Holy week in the gospel in John 11, right? That, the Pharisees are debating what to do about Jesus mm -hmm. um, about a week before his death. And Caiaphas is just like, you don't know anything. He says, better for one man to die than for the entire nation to perish. Yep. And so Caiaphas is named by name in St. John's Gospel. And this is like the first example in for the early church why the end doesn't justify the means. That you have to do the right thing regardless of consequences. So. Yeah. Even if the Cardinal's balancing all of these things between Europe and the New World, he's required to do the right thing for his territory, for the salvation of souls, for those Indians to come to the gospel, regardless of all these other things. And what shows us better than anything that this is the way to do it is Jesus' death, that Jesus will not compromise the truth. You know, we all know that. Peter took Jesus aside uh, and asked him, you know, basically not to suffer. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. But what if there was something a little bit less dramatic? What if one of the apostles said to Jesus, hey, you know, you got a great gig here with your preaching, your healing, you're raising the dead, you're giving life uh, and health to the lepers. There's tens of thousands of people in this country following you. Maybe dial it down a little bit against the Pharisees, because then you sink your entire ministry, all the healing, all the teaching, all the people following you, all the people learning about the Beatitudes. But why can't Jesus do that? Because he's called to do the right thing regardless of consequences. And by not dialing it down against the Pharisees, that leads to our redemption, the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So like, we have the perfect example in our Lord why consequentialism and another sing similar heresy of moral theology is called proportionalism, where you weigh, you weigh these different things. We're all called to do the right thing in life, regardless of what we think or fear might be one of the outcomes. Even if it's strategy for the gospel, you're never allowed to even strategize for the gospel if it means doing a venial sin today. You can't plan on saving a billion souls tomorrow by committing a venial sin today. Yeah, so that's that's a good point. And then also this. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing, Vincent, because that's kind of what the the the. The themes in the chosen kind of work that way, where they they're, they're like, "But what about your mission? You know, what about oh, your do? mission?" Oh no, I was just <laughs> and it's like, no, no, no. But you, no. you're pointing out why you can't do that. It's like, <laughs> oh no, did I sound like the chosen there? No, you did. You didn't say. No, you, that, you, you were describing you were arguing what, against them. Yeah, you were arguing what, like the what the the disciples in the chosen were saying, and you're saying, no, 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 you can't do that. You know, yeah, it's like people don't realize the the. No, I mean, I'm sure they do, but the reason Christ came was to suffer the passion. Yeah. Like that was, he, he was eager. I am eager to celebrate this passion. So like, knowing. look how many bishops today are afraid to criticize the Vatican and they'll say things behind closed doors. I'm 99% sure that they say this. I know, but just wait for homeboy to die. They use a different word than homeboy <laughs> Wait for him to die. And, uh, because if I speak up, I'm going to lose my seat. And then guess what? Someone more liberal comes in. 
So yeah. everyone, you know, we have to realize this heresy of moral theology of consequentialism. That's not just sins of commission. It's also sins of omission. omission. So all these people who think that they're strategizing and staying silent on like fiducia supplicans and stuff, you know, they might be strategizing, but they also might be losing their souls and committing sins of omission today for what they think is a good strategy tomorrow. But if Jesus showed us that, you know, losing your power in the hierarchy is going to be exactly what saves the entire world, namely Jesus as a rabbi being rejected by the Jewish hierarchy, what better example do we have than to speak up? So this ties into the cardinal. The cardinal should do the right thing even if he's ba balancing a thousand yeah. permutations of politics, you still have to, there's no one off. You don't get off the hook when you look at the crucifix. No one gets off the hook. The ends do not justify. That's means. what every, that's, yeah, that's it. everything what it comes down to. Like, the you, ends you play around with that. Means. You play around with that. Um, uh, what they do to you in philosophy 101 with situational ethics. Exactly. And they try to get you to start playing around with, well, you know, if you do this, if you do this, no, the ends don't justify the means you do what's right in that situation. Consequences be damned. I can, I can reach more people if I do this and this and this, no, God's the only one who can convert souls. And if you sin, how is God going to honor that by converting souls? It doesn't yep. work that way. Um, okay, so the next scene I have is the Cardinal visiting the mission. That's at 107. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this was funny. His father sends over four clips he wants to play, and I'm like, wow, I got 13. <laughs> it's like there was just so much stands out to me in this movie that I'm I, only like, picked, I, like, I thought I picked too many in the past. So remember, I only picked – actually, I only picked three. Uh, we usually do that. We usually pick three each, right? Yeah, it's fine. I felt like – I was picking too many in the past, so I'm fine if it's you this time who picked too many. I saw Ant's list. And I was like, well, at least I don't have to pick any. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, if you look at it, well, first off, I think all in my 13, your four are in there, right? So there's that, one. Uh, there's one that you didn't pick that he did. Okay, so we'll make sure we play that one. Well, too, we already so. did. Oh, okay. Was that um, the Korean War clip? <laughs> all right so let's go to the cardinal visiting the mission i mean nuclear test clip <coughs> again san miguel i think right Look at what they accomplished down there. I mean, this is second Christendom while Europe is falling apart. Reformation's happening. Europe is collapsing. Yeah, France and England are fighting the Seven Years' War at this point. Eight hundred seventy-five viewers. Can I say something real quick here? Yeah. I have some donors. I haven't met them in real life, but I have some donors to the charity I run. And they just took a trip down Baja, California, and they went Jesuit mission to Franciscan mission to Dominican mission to Jesuit to Franciscan to Dominican all the way down Baja. Baja is it's the fourth biggest peninsula in the world. Well, they sent me a 20 or 30 page um, history lesson of Baja. I popped it into this app called Voice Dream that reads as you go. It was so fascinating. I did this audio version of the 30 pages of the Jesuit missions and Dominican and Franciscan and Baja twice in my in my iPhone. And what was amazing is one of the central parts of this evangelization was music. They them getting the indigenous people to, to, to do this beautiful music. So what I'm trying to say is that scene that you just saw with the music is extremely accurate, you know, and just him showing up with the oboe and playing and stuff. That's not just you know, a cool song to have stuck in your head. It's always stuck in my head for weeks after this movie. That's actually historically accurate that the Jesuits um, truly evangelized through beauty and and that many of these indigenous people excelled in um, Catholic music. Yeah, and, they, and, and it is a unique and distinct Catholic culture they're bringing up there, right? That mestizo culture is very unique from European Christendom, even though the, the liturgy is the same, right? It's the Latin yeah. mass, they're celebrating there. There's still a very unique flavor 
to South American Christianity. Uh, That's Catholicism. right. It's, it's like you really do understand enculturation properly when you see the difference in South American Catholicism yep. versus European Catholicism. It's a, it's an, a genuine enculturation. Not like I, love, I love that you understand doctrine and liturgy isn't enculturated even at the cultures because, I mean, what did they have in Mexico City from Our Lady of Guadalupe until Vatican II? It was all Gregorian Masses. In fact, yeah, someone recently course. gave me um, Mexican Baroque music that was done at Gregorian Masses. Um, someone sent me some YouTube links just a few weeks ago. Do you think they were doing mariachi masses in Mexico no. City in the 19th century? No, that <laughs> there's no such thing as a mariachi mass in the last 500 years in Mexico prior to like 1965. Yeah, no, there's it just didn't yeah, exist. I would, I would argue that even because we do see the church in Africa looks very different, right? But I still think the church in Africa should have had the Latin mass and then those different enculturations on top of that. Instead well, they of tackled the that in Mass of the Ages 3, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, uh, but yeah, it's just interesting. Like you see the, the, the shoehorning in of certain things in the liturgy now that, you know, they're trying to come up with a, an Amazonian rite and all these, but those mm -hmm. are shoehorning in. That's not enculturation. That is trying to fit something in where it doesn't fit to try to look. It's like a virtue well, signal. Almost. Yeah, Mass of the Ages 3 has a black priest, has an African priest who loves the Latin Mass. And he explains they never wanted the changes. He says Africans love the silence. It was in so many words, he doesn't exactly say this. It was white Europeans who foisted the drums and the banging and the jumping around upon Africa. Because that's what Africans like, right? Is drums and banging and jumping around. No, the African priest in Mass of the Ages is, is like, we didn't want that. Yeah. It's the liberal whites who think this is what Africans do. The caricature. Yeah. What's funny is the, the Novus Ordo is far more colonial in the negative sense that the liberals exactly. love to use it. It's far more colonial than the Latin Mass ever was. Exactly. You have to jump around with your drums because that's what we expect. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's go back to it and show uh, just how beautiful his mission is. Now, there is a little communism mixed in here. A little bit. Sure. A little bit of communism in here. <laughs> Very impressive. Perhaps I'm missing something. I can't see any difference between this plantation, my own. That is the difference. This plantation is theirs. Your Eminence. This is another difference. A runaway slave, bought by a Spanish settler from a slave trader. I see. Is that lawful? Supply and demand is the law of trade. And the law of soul. What's a few cuts across the back compared with what you offer them? The torments of hell? Imprisoned souls? Think of that, your evidence. What do we have time-wise? continue? 108. Yeah. yeah, like 109 is where they actually have the little bit of communism mixed. The 109.30. Oh, weird. Where they... We're at 108 on both our live stream and mm. where we are in the movie. Oh, wow. That's weird. <laughs> what was your income last year, Father? Last year, 120,000 escudos. And how was it distributed? It is shared among them equally. This is a community. Ah, ah, yes. There is a French radical group that teaches that doctrine. Your eminence. It was the doctrine of the early Christians. Now you can see the writing uh, in this. That's very <laughs> like sure. <laughs> that's just very communist thinking. But what, what I do want to point out is you see, so this mission is the oldest mission down there. And you see that all the children are wearing clothes and you see that everybody is. So you see how the mission itself has an effect on their own culture and they're not running around in loincloths in the jungle and the children aren't running around naked in the jungle. So you you could like just, just seeing the impact that they're having, it's like, yeah, no, no, no. These people aren't sacrificing that third child because they're not on the run. They're in the mission. And they are working together to build this. They're like, I, you know, I don't think it would have been some communist utopia like that. I think there would have been 
people that had to get paid and you know things like that but and the other... difference between the early christians and this was the early christians all agreed to share everything in common where yeah. pr pr you know presumably if you become uh well i mean what their the liberation theology saw in that was it's implied it's foisted upon everyone in the community where you know, it's fine that in Acts of the Apostles they all shared everything, but it was a it was a decision each person right. got to make. It's never foisted upon you by the government, which is socialism. Right. Socialism and communism it is yeah. Yeah, exactly. it's fine if everyone wants to agree to do that. It just can't be forced on you. Yeah, look, every family is a communist little enclave, right? Like communism works in small groups. Like I, well, not in the modern family. In the modern family, there are separate bank accounts. <laughs> no, <laughs> man, my home is my home is a, a is a patriarchal patriarchal commune. <laughs> it's like I pay for everything. Everybody lives in community here. I'm just in charge. That's all. <laughs> Anthony, the patriarchal commune, <laughs> the patriarch of the commune. Oh, what is uh, what? Uh, what's the? Never mind. Keep talking. Um, all right, so I think where we got next, I, I jump all the way to one 121 at this point, and this has to do with the authority of the church. Yeah. You're like Napoleon from Animal Farm. That's what I was thinking about. <laughs> I have so Animal Farm. <laughs> so this is the other... Um, the other mission, the new one, at, no, the new mission that they just set up. So you can see the difference. You see people are, you know, still in loincloths and things. And though I knew well that to preserve itself there, the church must show its authority over the Jesuits here. I still couldn't help wondering whether these Indians would not have preferred that the sea and wind had not brought any of us to them. Yeah, so so now this is the scene where they actually have to tell them that they have to leave the jungle. They want they want you to speak more clearly. What what is it exactly you want me to do? They must leave the mission. Skip to one twenty four thirty, Rob, because that's where. So, uh, all right. So, basically, they're all told they have to leave, and these they all decide they're going to fight. Um. So now, when we get to here, this is them this is the priests and them being told what will happen if they fight well then you must persuade them not to fight i failed to persuade you to fight on their behalf if they do fight it is absolutely imperative that no one of you should even seem to have encouraged them to do so and therefore all of you will return with me to asuncion tomorrow if anyone should disobey this, you will be excommunicated, cut off, cast out. All right, so now you can pause it there. So uh, the next uh, yeah, yeah, scene yeah. I have is one twenty-eight thirty. So, but, but don't play it yet, just because um, because this goes into the um, the obedience thing that Father was talking yeah. about earlier, right? So they're being told. Not only can you guys not fight, but you can't even be seen as if you told them to fight or assisting them in any way. The, like this, this is absolutely not possible. You guys have to leave with me. And you know, last year I read uh, Malachi Martin's book, The Jesuits, about 500 pages long, and he used to be a Jesuit. And one of the important parts of liberation theology is fighting for the poor with violence. So in the 70s, in the 60s and 70s, there were Jesuits who joined the fight with weapons, um, uh, guns, and, you know, uh, would even kill. So one of the aspects we see of liberation theology isn't just kind of the sprinklings of socialism. It is De Niro's character taking up arms because 
that's what Jesuit and they were doing in the eighties too. You had Jesuits taking high power rifles in the eighties, um, fighting the people they considered capitalists, um, by even, by even killing them. So, you know, De Niro is sort of the proto liberation theologian here. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, so let's go. Or, let's go to that projection upon the past of current liberation theology yeah. is a better way to let's, put it. Let's jump to let's jump to the scene where De Niro makes his decision. I want to renounce my vows of obedience. I want to get out of Rodrigo. I won't listen to you. I love Jeremy Irons in this movie. Mm -hmm. Wasn't he Scar in Lion King? Yeah. No, it's Ralph and John too. What do you want, Captain? An honorable death? They want to live, Father. They say that God has left them. He's deserted them. Has he? never become a priest but i am a priest and they need me then help them as a priest if you die with blood on your hands rodrigo you betray everything we've done you promise your life to god and god is love you want to go to the next scene yeah so there's a scene that you see. Yeah, um, I have it at 130. My next scene, I don't know if it's before. I have us at 137, 37. Yeah. Father, I've come to ask you to bless me. Yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely what I want to watch. Okay, 37, 37. Father, I've come to ask you to bless me. If you're right, you'll have God's blessing. If you're wrong, my blessing won't mean anything. If might is right, love has no place in the world. But I don't have the strength to live in a world like that volcano. I, I just love Father Gabriel's character so much, man. Yeah. I, I I really fell in love with him in this movie because, he, 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 like, I really do think they portray holiness in him. You know, I know, I know you you have the the disobedience thing of him not leaving when he yeah, showed up. To this him. point, though, yeah, up to this point, total holiness. I see it too. You know, it's just like. He's re you could see his character is just so struck by the gospel and he has such a deep love for for Christ that yeah. he just he just sees that the go the gospel transformed the world. He's living in this violent world where even the church he belongs to is doing something unjust, but he's still so struck by the gospel that he just he just can't bring himself to see it from De Niro's point of view. And like you know Anthony you bought me um Tom Holland's book um who's been on your guys podcast. Dominion, yeah. I mean, how in the world did are there two billion Christians on the planet? You know, Islam makes converts by the sword. We have two billion by a crucified savior and uh, fifty million martyrs who didn't do violence but endured violence. And you know, and he really believes in that he believes in the crucified and risen Lord, and he believes in the martyrs, and and he understands it. It is not this is the this is the problem with liberation theology. It's not by violence yeah. that we're going to spread the kingdom of God. Um, so, and then you also see real quick, you also see an important uh, aspect of fiducia supplicans there that, you know, a priest can bless a sinner, but a priest can't bless a sinner in his decision to sin. Did you notice yeah. that? I can't bless you. Why? Because he's making a decision to sin. That's 
That's Fiducia Suplicans right there. That is. I didn't even think of that. So um, he's asking, which priest took the better path? And Vincent says it took more courage to take the path of Father Gabriel. So the thing is, if, if De Niro wasn't a priest, what he's doing is courageous. Like what, what the Guarani right. are doing is courageous. They're That's standing right. up and fighting for their home. Like we're not That's saying right. they should all just walk into their death. Right, and, and De, Niro, De Niro knows that. That's why he has to renounce his vows. Yeah, yeah. If he's not a priest, it's very different, right? But because he's a priest, it's what he's doing. I know he's doing it for noble reasons, and it can seem like I get it. I, I you know, I would want to fight on their behalf too. Yeah, and I know this is weird, probably coming from me, but I'm actually going to make the argument. I mean, I agree with you up to this point. Father Gabriel is holy, but I'm going to make the argument that neither of them did what a good holy traditional Jesuit would have done. And I'm going okay. to explain do you wanna, why. Do you want to go further ahead before you do? You want to do that now? Yeah, let's go further ahead before I get into that. Because okay. I think I think the war scenes were necessary to understand the two views of the two priests. So now this is this is that um, the, the Spanish army gets to the mission and what they hear kind of like breaks their heart and they and they, and they start to have a, their conscience hit them. Yeah, this is a great scene. Portuguese army, but Portuguese army. Portuguese, yeah. They're hearing them worship God, the God they brought there. I'm not interested. Take your position. Yeah, the Guarani are either had just finished or were about to finish mass, I think. Right, because the Eucharist is in there, right? So this must be another like warring tribe nearby that's just kind of uh, taking his mercenaries. Yeah, because that that kind of stuff happens all the time. Yeah, yep. amongst the Native Americans and Native South Americans, like they would just they were mercenaries. Mm -hmm. All of history, really. I mean, imagine thought... being a Portuguese. Man, baptized, you know, raised Catholic in Portugal, and then you come over and you're killing people at mass. You know, that it doesn't matter if you're taking orders. That's not going to land you in heaven. Yeah. That, so, all right, you can pause it, Rob. So that it's like you, you even look to all the wars of medieval Europe. There's an aspect of that. And it's like we're filling, we're killing fellow Christians, right? So it's like yeah. there were these breakouts of war in the Middle Ages, but they were they were pretty small. They weren't on any, you know, there was wasn't until you get to like world war one where you see large scale war and that's when the church uh, is out 30 years war actually with the protestants right with the, the protestants. first time there was massive armies oh in the 16th century under luther yeah so there was an but even like when you had france and england fighting it's it's strange because you have cardinals in in France helping the king there. You have cardinals in England helping the king there. It's still like this civility to it. But like when you when you come to a situation like this, like you're just listening to these monks in a mission celebrating mass, and you're about to burn it down and kill everybody. Like Amazing. that has to rip your heart out. Like how do you even? How do you even? You they should all have to do the penance that Robert De Niro had. You know, but after they after they finish this thing, and one of the things I want to talk about later, I keep giving these previews, and I shouldn't keep giving these previews. But one of the things we're going to talk about later is the difference between an unjust order and an unfair order, and then you know, like what what the two priests decide to do is different from an active order to go kill Christians, right? So to to cease and desist your mission work is not inherently bad. Mm. To kill people at mass is inherently bad, yeah. and so if it's not inher if it's not inherently bad, and it comes from a valid Catholic authority who's still Catholic, that's what's different from our current church crisis. Then you have to uh, then you have to obey it, even if it's distasteful to you. Yeah, that's why Father Gabriel. I guess I'm jumping into it. That's why Father Gabriel should have obeyed the cardinal's order to leave the missions, and why the soldiers should have disobeyed because they were following active sin where even though it's a very bad idea to leave the missions, it wouldn't have been sinful to obey that order. That's what you so, just trust. So, yeah. Okay. So now father Gabriel, the Cardinal tells him, tells him, I want you to leave with me tonight. You think he should have left with him that night? Absolutely. 
It's so, on it's on the shoulders of the cardinal. The Jesuits have taken an order, a, a vow of obedience to the Pope and the chain of command that's all the way up. And be, because it's an um uh it's a bad, it's a bad order, but it's not a sinful order, you have to obey a valid authority who's still Catholic, making you do something that you don't you don't think because we are we are in a hierarchy in the Catholic Church, so he should have obeyed it. And then you just trust my obedience to this is somehow going to send waves and waves of better missionaries because I'm in a Catholic because I'm in a, a church with a hierarchy. I have to trust that following this order, just like any military, right? Just like any yeah. any organization. Now, what, so what both, about? I would say both priests did the wrong thing. What about the? the aspect of there's no greater love than this than to lay down one's life for his friends because because he does do that yeah. like he's not going in he's not doing what de niro's doing he's just laying down his life and saying i won't let you die alone like i will be here with you to the end just being yeah like he's being a, i mean you want to talk about pastoral he just he just wants to he just wants them to know i didn't just set this up on you and build this thing and tell you god is real and i think i think he's genuinely concerned for their faith and he thinks that they could lose their souls if he doesn't stay there and lay yeah. down his life with them i think that's that's his motivation but that, that line greater love no man has in this is always united to Christ, the line from saint paul he was obedient unto death that yeah obedience to the church is tantamount to obedience to christ yeah and so you have to say i can't save these people i have to be obedient to the church even and this is again why the Jesuits they all they all left Europe and went to Russia yeah. when they were told you have to leave the missions because they understood even though it was a bad order it wasn't an order to sin see leaving leaving isn't an order to sin it was a very bad order um at least in this movie the cardinal would go to hell for that but you still have to obey it I mean like look at my life I left five Nova Soto parishes. Most of those I asked to leave because I couldn't deal with fights with Eucharistic ministers. Mm -hmm. But in the minority, when I was told to leave, even though I was hearing up to 40 hours of confessions a week, I left overnight. I immediately left. I knew I was doing a good job, but I obeyed because I believe in a structure. Yeah. I had to. I left overnight. I think they were bad decisions, but I'm not in charge. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. And once you start disobeying, it kind of causes chaos everywhere. It, it yeah. just shatters shatters the whole the whole edifice. So, um, I think uh, yeah, let's watch let's watch their death scenes, and you see the comparison of the two men. So obedience aside, yeah, I you know because that is a very important thing. But obedience aside, you I think what they're showing here is the difference in what one might think is the holy thing to do and what true holiness actually looks sure. like. That's a good point. You know, so, so like De Niro is fighting for his friends and he's laying down his life for his friends. Yeah. And so is Jeremy Irons character. And it's, I think you see a contrast of, of Christ and Barabbas almost. Ooh, that's pretty harsh against De Niro. Really? <laughs> he's such a phenomenal actor yeah he is just sucks his politics over there. <laughs> yeah, that's right
so now after this there is a bunch of indigenous nudity <laughs> but I, I can we go to the end credits it's not the credits it's what the cardinals speaking and like what the cardinals yeah. saying rob yeah let me find that here because and just make sure that because that's that's like the worst part of the like the, the kids running around naked that i noticed it was like but I don't know if you could. I don't know if you could hear what the cardinal says without seeing that, because the cardinal talks about the end of the Jesuit order. It's like so. So all this happens. I mean, to me, I think you're really seeing the 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 Christian way and the revolutionary way. And the reason yeah. I said Christ yeah. versus Barabbas, right? So who is Barabbas? Barabbas is like we know. Bar means son, right? So son of Abba. Bar Barabbas is son of the father. He's a false messiah. So Barabbas, um, I'm pretty sure uh, the movie Jesus of Nazareth portrays him better than the Passion almost because they show Barabbas as he's a zealot who wants to install a king of Israel. He wants to go to war with the Romans. He wants to, like, that's that's the point the, the point of Barabbas. He's a false messiah who wants to take, take for, for Israel the power of Israel. And a lot of the zealots wanted to crown Jesus as the king of Israel. Like that, that's, that's what they wanted. They wanted to crown him as the king of Israel. And it's just, it's an inverted kingdom that Jesus yeah. is bringing about. So to me, it seems like Mendoza is going for that. No, no, no. I'm going to be the warrior hero. And yeah. you really see Jeremy Irons character go, no, I'm going to be the Christ-like hero. And I'm going to just lay down my life as a sacrifice. Yeah, I agree with that. Or Judas, you know, Judas, many people believe Judas handed over Jesus because he wasn't mo moving fast enough for the temporal kingdom that Judas yeah. wanted to have to be established. Yeah. You know, Jesus of Nazareth portrays that. Did you ever see Jesus of Nazareth? Yeah, Except sure. I, like, movie. I, I really think, I mean, look, it is a little bit of hippie Jesus, with Robert Powell in there, you know, it's sure. a little bit of that, but I really loved how they portrayed Jesus and Barabbas. Those are two characters. I really loved how they got the nuance of the zealots of the time. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's hard to find that in movies about the life of Christ, but the, the zealots really wanted revolution with Rome and they wanted to be like the Maccabees and like go about yeah. it like that. It just wasn't. No, I, wasn't... Think, I think that is why Judas betrayed Jesus. And I don't mean to downplay the beauty of that scene. You have the Eucharist, you have him dying for his people. You have people walking with our Lord in the Eucharist and dying. I mean, I, I just think an old school Jesuit should have obeyed, but that's not to downplay. Like you said, I mean, there's something so Christ-like about him him in that scene, he's with his people. He's willing to die for them. He loves them. It's it's a Eucharistic centered love of them. Um, so maybe I jumped too quick into the. the no, I don't the, think he did. I think you. I think you're right to point out. You know, I don't. I don't. I don't think. I don't think we really put because we're dealing with a different church almost. We, uh, almost. I know I can't say that we're dealing with almost like a different church in that time. Because right? look at okay. Look at the difference since I mentioned Fiducia Supplicans. Padre Pio obeyed when he was told he couldn't do public masses anymore. Was that a was that an unjust or an unfair order? Well, it, it's probably closer to unfair than unjust, right? Because it's not sinful for him to obey that. He still offered his daily mass. It just couldn't be public. Yeah. So it wasn't sinful for Padre Pio to obey the command of his superiors to refrain from public mass for a decade, which you know, killed him as much as the stigmata. Let's be honest about it. But if I were to do what's in fiducia supplicans, I would lose my soul. I would go to hell yeah. for obeying it. That's yeah. what's different about this stuff. That's yeah, an Ver unjust. That's an unjust order yeah. from Cardinal Fernandez, who I'd say is a non-Catholic. Not, hey, not bring it. Bring it even. Bring it even to the communion in the hand stuff that you were dealing with earlier yep. on, right? Exactly. Like that, you like. I mean, maybe you could say yeah, it's it's not sinful to receive communion in the hand, but it's like that is something that if it's in your conscience, like I can't in good conscience receive communion on the hand and I can't be forced yep. to do that. I'd rather not receive. Exactly. So I understand the difference. And I because we, you really have to grasp what Father's saying is that there's a difference in an unjust and an unfair command. Exactly. And is it coming from a bad Catholic or a non-Catholic yeah. with what Fernandez is pushing? That seems like public apostasy to me. That seems like non-Catholic, not bad. You know, Padre Pio was obeying bad Catholics who were jealous, telling him to do things which were unfair, but not sinful for him to follow. 
if I were to do what Cardinal Fernandez is saying, that seems like it's a non-Catholic telling me to do something that I'm going to sin and lose my soul as a priest, bless people in alternative marriages. Um, so no, I'm not going to obey unjust orders coming from a man who has some evidence that he's a public apostate. Well, people would say, who are you to say that? You know why? Because I have common sense. I don't have yeah. to have a, a formal trial of somebody to know if you're commanding those things, you're not Catholic anymore. I don't care how many people say you don't have the authority to say it. Yes, I do. I, I'm a baptized Catholic. It has nothing to do with my priesthood. I'm a baptized Catholic who has eyes and ears, and I have common sense. Yeah. You know, yeah. and you can we're, see not, we're not Muslims who believe in this positivistic obedience that I have to obey this until someone higher than me removes him. No. If there's evidence that these people are not Catholics and they're telling me to sin, I'm not going to obey. So that's why it's different. I know it sounds like I just shifted from what I was saying 10 minutes ago, but there's a huge difference between an unjust order and an unfair order. Yeah, I think that's the most interesting conversation of the night because I, I don't think I've ever really like hammered that that out i i really do i so the there was a point earlier that somebody said this is the best catechesis i've heard on this series so far i forgot what we were talking about there. that was the consequentialism consequentialism oh yeah 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 so the the ends never justify and justify means. the means yeah exactly so that and i think unfair versus unjust orders by legitimate authorities exactly are, are, that's a that's a really interesting because we we are in a time where you're getting some unjust commands and maybe some unfair commands. I mean, we're about to get hit with a, a new document. And Infinite dignity. Mm. Dignitas infinitas. So, look, our my theory on that is going to be... Well, I, my theory on it at first was it was going to deal with the same-sex question again. But we had Nick uh, Cavazos on, and he had a really good point. He goes, look... The gender stuff they're going to be great on. I'm telling you, because this is how this is how this Vatican works. They're going to be great on the gender stuff. Um, you're you're going to get this is going to this is going to be like an enforcement of mass immigration and climate change and the death penalty. Those are the things they're going to play with human dignity on. I think Anthony Stein agrees with that from his podcast, Return to Tradition. He's implying. I don't think he directly said this. He's implying the same things as those three. Yeah, it's like it's like the look, they have a very specific say those thing again, they're going Anthony, for. Say those again. So it's going to be immigration, um, climate maybe change. climate climate change, and it's going to be the death penalty. The death penalty, they really want to hammer down that death penalty and make it just completely in, immoral. So, like that that language, inadmissible, isn't really a theological term. It's nope. it's just it's not a theological <laughs> not, term. Inadmissible. Not, what does that right. mean? What does that even mean, inadmissible? So they can't come right out and say it's intrinsically evil because to say it's intrinsically evil would say that the church erred, so, yep. you know, erred in her judgments. So they just say, no, nah, it's just inadmissible, which absolutely means nothing. It's That's just hilarious. It's the opinion of a man. It's inadmissible. But no, it's really not, though. So and then I just watched a story of a guy who murdered his wife. They put him in prison. And within 30 minutes, he murdered his cellmate. And it's like, don't tell me the death penalty is inadmissible. <laughs> Some people cannot be kept contained and keep people around them safe like they're that's just right. that's right and some some crimes Plus are so it's, horrific you it's just right simply just yeah the, the definition of just yeah. actually it's crazy because if you go back a hundred years it's like people would people get hanged for stealing something it's like you, you stole something hang him and now <laughs> it's like well he committed a double murder uh you know he burned his children alive now let's give him life in prison and with possibility of parole. With possibility of parole, yeah, exactly. Yeah, people are sick. So yeah, we'll so we'll see where that document goes. It's coming out Monday. And everybody's making Monday. I thought it was coming out in October. No, April oh, 8th. April Whoa. 8th. Yeah, they somehow timed it for uh the feast of the uh, annunciation. Feast of the uh, Annunciation, every eclipse, every Marian feast, that man puts out something to destroy the church. It's crazy. So the feast of the annunciation, you have uh, the eclipse, you have the Hadron Collider going, you have uh, there's a comet called the Devil's Comet passing near Earth. <laughs> it's like all these things happening. Do you so, remember? And like, look, Traditions Custodes came out on the, the initial one, came out on Our Lady Mount Carmel in July uh, when he put all those animal pictures in enormous holograms all over the Vatican. That was December 8th, the Immaculate Conception. I mean, how, how hard is it to connect the dots on this stuff? How much you know who hates Our Lady? Well, 
We'll see yeah, how you guys don't have go, to agree with but... that. I'm just gonna let I'm just gonna let that hang out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I just don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> but we will. Uh, all right. So, what's the next movie we think we should do, guys? Wait, did you want to do this? Well, see is this? The, we are we able to? I think we're far. I this is where he begins talking, and I okay, think they good. just get Perfect. farther away. If I see something, I'll just stop it. But so, your holiness. Now your priests are dead, and I am left alive. But in truth, it is I who am dead, and they who live. For as always, your holiness, the spirit of the dead will survive in the memory of the living. Yeah, it really just shows the cardinal was tormented with his decision um, because in the end, I really do think he is the one who played around with situational ethics. I think he's the one who had the authority to make the decision. And I think he should have said, no, these missions stand. These, these are God's children, their souls, they're baptized. We are civilizing these people. We're getting them out of the jungle away from murdering each other, away from human sacrifice. He had a duty to those missions especially since he allowed them to be set up in the first place those were his children let's talk about bishop strickland for a minute he's someone who if he if you had him on his show he wouldn't agree with everything i believe theologically i don't believe with him uh, with him or i'm not i die with him on everything on the papacy and some other things but guess what there is a man who decided he's gonna put aside this bad philosophy the end justifies his means he knew he had to stand up for the gospel. He knew it meant he would have to move out of his diocese if he spoke up for the truth. And it's not even the truth of traditional Catholicism. We're talking about the basics of the gospel that man defended. And he loved his diocese. He loves his diocese, right? And yet he understood he had to do the right thing regardless of consequences. Who in 100 years, if Jesus doesn't return on April 8th with you know, uh, <laughs> during the eclipse in a hundred years, who's going to be remembered in the American church, a, a bishop who kept his diocese in silence because he didn't want a liberal to replace him. No, Bishop Strickland's going to be the one remembered in a hundred years as the hero. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. I think they're the ones he will, they, he will be the one that they talk about in the history books down the road. No one's going to remember anyone else's names except him. Yeah, you'll, you, you, the couple of people that actually stood up to this nonsense. I mean, you'll probably hear about Vigano in the future. Yep. You know, I you'll hear he you'll... Pope, but it's a different topic. <laughs> but yeah, I think I think there are very few who are willing to stick their neck out and still follow an uh, an unfair order because what happened to Strickland was an unfair order and possibly unjust. But I think that was unfair. But he said, look. I will not resign because that would be unjust. I have a duty to my flock. I am a bishop in my own right. Like I do, because you even see in Vatican II, it talks about how the bishops are not mere puppeteers of the Pope. Like the bishop has real authority within his diocese. Unless you, unless you say something a little too orthodox these days, apparently <laughs> then they can just yank you out. So, but yeah, I think you're right about uh, Strickland. Hey, Rob. We need a word from your from your kid there. <laughs> uh, my kid needs a bath because she's covered in an Oreo. An Oreo? <laughs> all over her face. Well, it is the Easter octave. <laughs> yeah. Um so, all right. So next next movie we're going to do is Beckett, right? Yep. Finally, Rob gets his pick. Finally, yeah. Is Beckett black and white? No. No. Okay. I've never Come seen on. it. <laughs> I've never you seen like it. the one black and white movie we did so far. I do. I did. Um, okay, so Beckett is next, and then what are what do you are guys think of the, the one the last after? Thursday of the month, right? Okay, so what's the date for that, Father? Are we sticking with yeah, let's Thursday stick with last month? Thursday of the month, but it's let's um, I'm gonna have to remember this on how I promote this. We're gonna only have this on Facebook, Twitter, and then YouTube's gonna be delayed. Is that right? I think yes. that's the best way to do it. So we could play the clips and then we'll just yeah. put we'll run this through the Right, I mean, we have twelve hundred and thirty people watching right now. No way! Most, we most down live like views we've ever had. Most wow. live views we've ever had. I mean, you may That's not get amazing. it on the YouTube 
picker, but who cares? 1,230 people watch this. So let's just make sure everyone who's watching this understands last Thursday of the month, we, I mean, here's the thing. I prefer YouTube, but it's just not working out. So you do got to join us on Twitter. Okay. So that's Thursday, April 25th. We're doing right. Yep. I'll be at a mysterious country in the middle of the Mediterranean at that point, but I can still, I'll still be in it. Will you be able to at the time though? Yeah. I'm bringing my MacBook. I, I can no, get my entire, no. like, are you going to be up in the middle of the night for it? Oh, uh, can we do it in the morning? No, we no, both Thursday. have work. You guys work? Weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we, I'll get I mean, in the middle we, of the night. That's we fine. did it on the weekend. You want to do it Saturday? Uh, let me see here. I'm, yeah. Is that uh, April? The 27th. Yeah. Can we do that on April 27th? Would that work? Yeah. yeah I, can, I can get up in the morning. Okay, so be, it, you'd be what six hours ahead, right? So six, I'm six ahead of the East Coast. Yeah. Okay. So you what guys want to say work? like um, I don't know, 10 a.m. East Coast time, something yeah, like that. That way, it's 10 a.m. afternoon Eastern for you. Yeah. Right. Okay. So let me just see. So something. everyone is asking if they can. We do it on just one Twitter account in the future, so that they're all in the same chat. I think that's a good oh, idea. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. So, so what I, you from the avoiding Babylon one? I, from going forward from now, we will only put live shows on the avoiding Babylon account. Well, how many people? That's, how many people are uh, subscribed to that? Uh, you know, subscribe on Twitter. Oh, I only about a thousand, but it's getting almost as many views as your account. Is it? Yeah. Well, okay. I, I, let's just think of it this way. Your account and my account are much more likely to get suspended on Twitter permanently than the Avoiding Babylon account. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so, so are you saying I can't retweet our live video on Twitter? No, you can. can. You There's can. an Avoiding Babylon Twitter. Okay. Yeah, that's it's what at I mean. Avoid Babylon. That's what I went. To. Oh, maybe. It, okay. We'll talk about it off the air. We don't need to bore yeah. people. Oh, okay. So April so 27th? April 27th, we'll do Beckett. April 27th at 10 a.m. Invitees. I'll give everyone a view of the Mediterranean. We'll see if they can guess where I am. <laughs> All right. Tell me if you guys got that invite. I just sent it. The calendar on email? Invite. Yeah, well, I sent you a calendar invite. Oh, I'll check later. We don't want to bore our listeners. Yeah, okay. Yeah, All right, so to... Beckett next, and what are we thinking for after Beckett? Because I like to have the next one in the can. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Like... One on deck, one in the hole. Is that the baseball term yeah. on deck and in the hole? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we got Beckett on deck. Who's in the hole? What, uh, any suggestions from the... I, I, have a list. You, I know you have yours. I'll, I'm will i going to veto one of yours, though, Anthony. Tell me... Or no, not veto. Tell me the next three that's on your mind, and I'll tell you my vote of those three. Okay, let's see. Well, I'll just I'll just tell you what we have. I mean, should we do for greater glory one day? I, I think so. That. Yeah. Um, I'm just gonna run through them. You, I I would like to do Francesco eventually. That's the Mickey Rourke version of Saint Francis because okay. I think Father will like that. It's a very unique. It's not brother, son, sister, moon, man. You really it's think a, I will, huh? It's a, it's a even very, with the hair gel and everything. No, it's a gritty version of Saint Francis, man. He's got hair gel in the picture I saw. Well, that's before he becomes St. Francis. Oh, okay. Um, Because you know how 13th century salesmen had uh, hair gel. The black robe is good, but I think there's a scene of nudity in the black robe. I have to double check that. Uh, There be dragons. Um, Would we want to do nefarious at some point? The anti-trafficking one? No, nefarious is the... Oh, the the exorcism one. Exorcism one. That movie's all dialogue. That's the problem. Um, <laughs> Most of what we show is dialogue. That's true. That's true. Um, I, I like right, for greater so glory. What about what about one of the old ones like Scarlet and the Black and stuff, or um, Song of Bernadette or something? Song of Bernadette. That's a great movie. I only saw that for the first time three years ago. Yeah, me too. Um, Anthony, Song of Bernadette. Or, okay, so <laughs> back in Song glory. of Bernadette, or for, or for greater glory. We will want to go with the newer one in between the two old ones, just for Anthony's sake. 
All right. So I would say uh, we could save Francesco and for greater glory. Like, I think those are like big ones for me. Would we ever want to talk about like the Catholicism within like sound of music? No, I hate music. <laughs> like I have no desire to do that. Not even a little. I really don't. I'm sorry. Done, okay, so you know what? I guess I'm not looking forward to Francesca, but we haven't done a Saint movie. Oh no, we are. We're doing Beckett. You oh, haven't I'm, seen it I'm yet. Open. Though. I'm open. All right. You haven't seen it yet. I mean, you liked all the same movies. I think oh, you you're gonna like this. All one. right. So we're gonna do Beckett. You pick the next one. What, what about a Hidden Life? No, that's I'm just saying, it's an something. amazing movie. It's a very yeah. long movie. And it's boring. three hours long. Okay, yeah. so let's pick up those three. Hidden Life, Francesco, or Greater Glory. I'm happy with it, any of those three. Look, I, think we, do, I think we do Greater that. Glory. Okay, for Greater Glory. All right, so Beckett, in, Beckett, on, Beckett on deck next, and for Greater Glory after that. Cool. Wow, this is awesome. We got all these people in the live chat or Twitter or whatever it is. So for Greater Glory, I think... That's like top three Catholic movies of all time, in my opinion. People want to, you know, Father Ripperger was um, greatly, uh, um, he asked, he was asked a lot of questions on Nefarious. So he helped inform that movie a lot. Oh, it was, it was very good. It was it, a great it, movie. It was basically screw tape letters. Like it was done that well, the dialogue. Father Ripperger and I, we, we both sang a prophecy at the same uh, traditional parish and he walked in the sacristy. On Saturday night, he goes, they even let you in here? I said, yeah, pretty low bar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that he has a sense of humor. That's pretty funny. Um, all right, guys. So this is a good one. I, it went, we went quicker than I thought we would because we had 13, 14 scenes to go through this episode. So we, 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 we boogied through it, which is good because I have to wake up a little early tomorrow. So, all right, guys. So once this is up on YouTube, we'll see how it even does on YouTube. But. 13 almost 1300 live viewers right now and as long as people are enjoying it we there can is, do it this way and there is one scene in beckett where you know the, the king's in bed with one of his concubines and kind of smacks her behind and you know so fast forward that a little one. bit yeah a little What's, it's not, in, it's in not where? Movie, in which one? definitely in modesty so in beckett. beckett yeah, yeah. You remember that scene okay I so we'll know. make sure we don't highlight that scene yeah fast um, forward, have our have our listeners fast forward it too so what i'm gonna do with the youtube i'm gonna upload it and I'm going to set it to air at, let's see, tomorrow's Wednesday. I'll set it to air at 4 p.m. Eastern tomorrow, hoping I can get through the appeal by then. If it doesn't, it might not air at that point, but the, uh, that's what I'm going to plan on, 4 cool. p.m. Okay. Eastern tomorrow. This is fun. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah that, Father, fun. thank you so much. This This whole series was your idea from our conversation about movies when we hung out last summer. So. And, so far, I've liked it a lot more than I thought I was going to, going to other than that Padre Pio movie. So you did like the mission, though, right, Rob? Oh, I like this a lot, yeah. Okay, good. I do did think it was a, I think it's a very accurate movie for what the missions were like. I mean, I was too hard on some of the little aspects that, you know, were beyond even artistic license. But, I mean, I really think it captured um, what was it like, you know, what was it like to grow up in Spain or France or Portugal and and, you know, you could have been an artisan or something. And then you tell your parents you're going to go be a Jesuit and you leave and they understand you're really never going to see them. Even if you don't die a martyr, you're probably never going to see them again. Oh, you know, yeah. um, the trip from Lisbon to Paraguay, that was three, four, five, six, seven months. You know, um, you really can't overestimate. You really can't exaggerate how difficult those trips were. Um, coming across the ocean and then oh, yeah, imagine, with the understanding right? that, you know, you really were giving your entire life for the salvation of souls. If you joined the Jesuits or Franciscans or the Dominicans, and you get a little touch of that in the movie of, you know, things we don't see, like what will you bit by at night in just a makeshift tent? Yeah, I right? mean, they probably woke up with every well, night, every morning with hundreds of new bug bites. Imagine yeah. what you're signing up for as a missionary in the 17th century or 18th century. How many right? of them died of malaria? A thousand things. I mean, you know, the, you guys... the opening scene, but maybe we should have included this. I mean, one of the most moving yeah. scenes is the opening one. The very first missionary that shows up in the movie, The Mission, they're like, oh, you like the crucifixion so much? Great. We'll tie you to the cross. Man. And they put him on. Yeah. And it goes over the uh, over the falls. 
Um, there did either of you see Father Damien of Molokai, that movie? I thought it was pretty good. I only, there we are. Thanks for showing this. That's a great way to end the show today. I yeah. thought it was pretty good, but I haven't. I saw it twenty years ago. A lot of my opinions on theology have changed. Yeah, that's the problem. Ago. I saw I saw it about a decade ago, and like I'm thinking, like there's probably a bunch of modernism rammed in there. <laughs> so, but like I remember at the time seeing it and being like, "Wow, man!" I thought like, it was this guy good. this guy walked into a leper colony knowing he was going to die and still mm -hmm. did it. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's very similar to what you're saying with the Jesuits. Like they are signing up, and it's almost like a guarantee something horrific is going to happen. But, and we should right. be open in the future to movies that aren't cat. I mean, we're already doing this, but like, you know, Lord of the Rings, I love it. Maybe that's a little bit overdone, um, but maybe we should also look at some movies that we don't normally think of as Catholic, maybe not even made by. I mean, Catholic. this wasn't cat. This is a secular movie, right? Yeah. I bet they had Jesuits but, informing them how right. to make it though. Yeah. And it was about Catholicism. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Maybe we, we could even like, pick movies that, that have really um, beautiful well, like, uh, analogous. Like we, Themes like what we did with Mel. What's that? Mel? Like, yeah. No, Mel. Yeah. He said, like what we did with Mel, just even talking about Mel oh, Gibson's exactly. Movie. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, that obviously, what's his name was not a Catholic. Mm -hmm. The uh, the guy, the hero of the hero of Hacksaw Ridge was not a Catholic. Yeah. All right. So let's run through um some of our, the ones that we definitely want to get to, and then we can start asking. Do, um, do you have restless hearts on your list, Anthony? I do. Okay. Uh Father, can you speak to why the Jesuits seem to have changed so much? Uh, so Miss B, congratulations on coming back to the church. She has an amazing story. I think we, a lot of us have been following her on Twitter. So mm -hmm. welcome you back. Um, uh, let me answer your question. Why have the Jesuits changed so much? I'm going to, I'm going to have an answer. That's going to, some of your listeners aren't going to like it very much. Um, <laughs> I really do the love the old school Jesuits. I think I'm having people brace for an answer. A lot of people aren't going to like very much. Um, I think the Jesuits were the greatest order that ever existed and they just did everything better than every other order in the sixties. I would argue 99.99% of the orders went to the modernist heresy, but just as the Jesuits did evangelization better than every order, they also went into heresy better than every order in the sixties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but because they don't hide their heresy as well as like the Franciscans or the, the Dominicans, they take a lot of flack from a lot of the neoconservative, non-traditional orders. But the fact is this, here's, here's what is not going to make me very popular. All the other orders are just as heretical as the Jesuits. They're just not as bold about it. Sorry to say it, but if you get a Dominican or a Franciscan one-on-one, -on -one, they're going to say the same things as the Jesuits. They're just not as public about it because they don't want to take as much heat. Now, you do have people that have gone beyond your average ones like, like James Martin, but he has his counterparts even on Twitter among the Franciscans. The Haran and... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, the Jesuits are very big. They're bold about their heresy. But, I mean, which orders stuck totally Thomistic following the sixties and stuck with the Latin mass. I mean, none of them except Archbishop Lefebvre starting SSPX. And, you know, we know, we know what happened in 1988 with that. So I'm not saying, I'm not saying the Jesuits are okay. They're, they're, they're in a really bad state right now, but. Well, well what so makes it so others. bad is that they were so good. That's right. Mm -hmm. That They're full from grace because they were the, they were the freaking military arm of the, you they know, were, they, they were, they they were the, the soldiers of the Pope, man. Yeah. So, I mean, her question is excellent. What happened to the Jesuits? Um, I do want to read, I put this in my blog. This is, uh, I didn't know if anyone was going to ask that question, but, you know, a lot of, I, I tend to blame Vatican II for everything, but Malachi Martin shows what happened even to a few of them, not many of them. Here's what happened even in the 19th century to a few of them. Now, I'm not one of those people that's going to say learning has led to arrogance. It was actually only like a few of them getting really high on like some of their learning that really led to this arrogance that became the seed for modernism that sunk the Jesuits. So this is from Malachi Martin's uh, page 219 to 220. Listen to this. People might find this interesting. Um, for around this time, he's talking about 19th. So we're not talking 20th century. This is 19th century. And he's not talking about the majority of the Jesuits. 19th century, the majority of them were very solid. But he says, 
For around this time, in view of the rising importance of the social question, the growing impact of Marxist, Marxistic communism and the huge leap of the natural sciences, the society decided to specialize its young men in the new branches of knowledge, such as, now get this, listeners, physics, chemistry, paleontology. Okay, I have no problem. I'm a trad who's all for science. I was pre-med at Boston. I love science. But now keep listening. Anthropology, physiology, Assyriology, <coughs> oriental religions, Egyptology, sociology, and biology. Okay, no problem in studying those things. But you can hear in Assyriology, oriental religions, and Egyptology, they're starting to think, just a few of them, not the majority of the Jesuits, maybe we can mix this into Catholicism. So Malachi Martin uh, continues. He says, um, insensibly there started emerging through the society and by society means the society of jesus who is the jesuits insensibly there started emerging through the society a never vocalized but quite well-knit brotherhood of highly trained academic specialists they rarely if ever voiced their true feelings and ideas but they found it increasingly difficult to reconcile the data of their scientific and scholarly training with the with the traditional doctrines and morality propounded by the Roman Catholic Church and officially officially defended by the society. Almost done. Two more sentences or three. In their work, they consorted with non-Jesuit, non-Catholic scholars engaged in studies similar to theirs, read their results and developed an understanding for their point of view, which almost without exception was anti-Catholic and theologically mar modernist. Two branches of secular science had an especially deep impact on Jesuit theological scholarship, archaeological, linguistic, and historical research in the Near East, the cradle of Christianity, and modern researches into anthropology and paleontology. So it was a fascinating, it's fine for Jesuits to study ancient Near East cultures to learn how to convert them. The problem is their study of ancient Near East cultures made them want to incorporate these eastern gods into the trinity and those eastern gods are just demons isn't that kind of what um what's his name did after you know he wrote the seven story mountain and then started going a little off the rails by going a little bit mixing in the eastern stuff exactly and you you said it perfectly about seven minutes ago anthony there's a phrase in latin corruptio optima pessima corruptio optimi pessima that means the corruption of the vet the corruption of the best becomes the very worst that's yeah. my view of the jesuits corruptio optimi pessima they were the best. These were the Navy SEALs of God. These were the Navy SEALs of the Pope. These were the Navy SEALs, the, the, the Army Rangers who could who went all over the globe to convert the globe. But they let that greatness get to their head and they started incorporating their studies uh, or into their studies a little bit of syncretism. And then that was a little bit of leaven that exploded throughout the whole order. Yeah. And now they are the worst. I'm not doubting that they're the worst <coughs> now. I just don't think they should... I think it's easier to blame the Jesuits than it is to blame Vatican II. And I, yeah. I don't think that's fair. Well, it's also having having uh, the papacy is having a Jesuit right now doesn't help that impression. So, <laughs> well, it's in, the, it's in the constitutions of St. Ignatius, no Jesuits allowed to be Pope. That's in his constitutions. So, yeah. one more piece of evidence in. <laughs> all right we're gonna wrap this up we got 1400 not, not, not. 1468 people in the chat right in the in the live stream right now so that is by far our biggest viewed show live show for sure so cool um yeah guys let's uh let's keep doing the series all right so we're gonna do the next one on a saturday and rob and i will be back on thursday and we did not forget about trivia we will be doing trivia soon i just haven't decided i, I literally I keep reminding him every other day guys we're gonna do it we're gonna do it so all right guys thank you so much for joining us this has been episode five of faith and film we'll see you thursday okay happy easter christ is risen he is risen, risen indeed. indeed amen mm -hmm.